Dr. Carrie Jones, thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Uh, can you share a little bit about your background first and what are you uh, involved in at the moment? <laughs> so many things. Yes, I have been uh, practicing in medicine. I've been in, the, in our industry for about 23 years this July, but I've actually been a doctor for 17 years. And uh, the whole time I pretty much have focused in women's health and hormones and um, the impact that hormones has on the rest of the body. And now I am the head of medical education for a company in the States here called Rupa Health that works with a lot of lab work, not just hormones. And so I'm learning a lot about mold and Lyme disease and metals and all sorts of other testing that I just didn't have to dive into in all those years of practice. Wow, that's interesting. You have a very long, long history as well, and a lot of experience <laughs> being a doctor. So I'm super excited to talk about hormones because that is, oh my God, that's such a, I don't even know where to get started when <laughs> hormones. It's such a wide field, and it's also very important and integral for our well being and health. Let's start actually from, from the basics. What are hormones? What are hormones? They are chemical messengers. They're, they're basically like, um, like a text message or uh, a key that would come out and fit in a lock. So our brain signals down to all of our endocrine glands, our thyroid, our ovaries, our testicles, our pancreas to create these hormones. And then the hormones go to where they need to go to their receptor and like a key in a lock can activate and turn them on or in some cases turn them off. So it's if we, I joke all the time, it's like the story of Goldilocks. Like we don't want too much. We don't want too little. We want it to be just right. Sort of depending on what's going on and where we are, but uh, yeah, they're, they're just, they're just little chemical messengers. Okay. What are some key hormones that in your view, everyone should know about? <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Yeah. So a lot of the times I'm working with women and women, of course, will start to say, I feel hormonal. They'll use the broad term. I, it's my hormones. I know it's my hormones and they don't really know what hormones they're talking about, but they, they do know what the feeling is. And so a lot of times we're talking about things like estrogen in particular, your estradiol. We're talking about progesterone, testosterone and men or women. We're talking about, um, adrenal hormones, DHEA, DHEAS. So these are cortisol. Like these are some big ones that just as humans on the everyday um, in, the, in the field that I work in, that's what we're testing. That's what we're talking about. That's what's giving us some of these symptoms that we just don't like. Mm, you mentioned women and men like separately. What are the key differences that we should be aware of when we talk about hormones for, for men and, and women? Um, the place of production and the amount that gets produced. So for example, uh, this is, I think everyone will know this, but we both make testosterone, but men make testosterone 99, 95% of it comes from their testicles. Um, and they make a lot more testosterone than we do as females. Whereas our testosterone can come from three different places. We make it in our ovaries, we can make it in our adrenal glands, and we can make it in what's called our peripheral tissue. So in, um, uh, we, have a, we have a prior hormone called androsenedione that can turn into testosterone sort of out in the rest of our body. So in, instead of just concentrating our testosterone in one spot, it gets diversified, which on the one hand is nice, but on the other hand, if we have adrenal issues, or if we are in menopause, or we have lost our ovaries, let's say we've had a hysterectomy, if our ovaries removed, you're going to miss a big percentage of that testosterone. So a, um, a production amount, and then location are really big, pretty big differences between us. Okay, yeah, that that's interesting. Uh, one thing you mentioned that people often say I'm hormonal. <laughs> yes. I've, I've said that as well and then I started to contemplating on it and I realized that I even yeah even me like I, I'm saying I'm just feeling a little bit off 
somehow. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what causes this, but I'm feeling hormonal, whatever <laughs> that means. Uh, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about hormonal balance or being in balance? Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. So we use the word balance and I know that it drives conventional practitioners crazy because then, especially in a female, we cycle if we're cycling and not menopausal. So we're never balanced is an even one level consistent. It's our hormones are not like a garden hose. Like we don't just turn on the faucet and out comes water in a steady stream. As we know, our hormones go up and down in a very synchronized sort of calculated rhythm. So the balance we talk about is when you are in this rhythm, that your rhythm is doing what it's supposed to do on the day of your cycle, it's supposed to be doing it. And so estrogen goes up. It's like, it's actually, some people use the analogy like a symphony, uh, like music and others say a roller coaster. It's a very controlled roller coaster. And so, um, in the sake for our hormones, I gen- I often say roller coaster because our estrogen goes up our estrogen comes down, right? Our estrogen goes up, our estrogen comes down. And then our progesterone is the opposite. Our estrogen's down, our progesterone is down, and then it comes up. And so it depends which part of the cycle you're in. So when we say balance, I am looking at those hormones throughout the cycle and where you are on this controlled roller coaster, um, making sure your the, the pulses are firing when they're supposed to your estrogen's up when it's supposed to be, but not up too high, not too low. Same for progesterone. Progesterone only comes out after ovulation. So do you ovulate? And then do you have the healthy cells and the mitochondria to make the progesterone? Do you have the brain health, the brain pulses to even encourage these hormones to come out? And so that's what we mean by balance is everybody playing their role in doing what they're supposed to be doing on this roller coaster track as opposed to one level all the time that just doesn't happen in the body Mm -hmm. and do men also have roller coasters or are they more stable um they're more stable (laughs) but they do have some roller coasters so testosterone for example comes out when they sleep so men make produce their highest amount of testosterone um which is in the in the late um late night early morning which is why when they get testosterone tested, it's often suggested to them, they should get their lab work done. First thing in the morning, like when the lab opens right away, don't wait and get their testosterone drawn later in the day because their testosterone does follow some sort of rhythm. Now there are other hormones, estrogen, progesterone, men absolutely make estrogen and progesterone, just not the same amounts, don't follow as much of a rhythm. And they surely don't cycle the same way that that women cycle. Now men, some will say that men, you could say men have a longer cycle. So it takes roughly 70 days to make sperm. And so the, like, like the act of sperm production goes through a cycle. So as, whereas most women go through a menstrual cycle, every 28 ish days, the act of making sperm, which does require testosterone, um, takes longer or like 70, 70 some days. And so they may actually feel, some men will say that they feel more on a, they jokingly say I'm, I'm cycling. <laughs> it's just longer. It's just longer. Now, of course, men have circadian cycles as in their cortisol goes up and down, just like our cortisol goes up and down. Um, and their testosterone, like I said, is in the morning, but it's not the same as us, as us females. Yeah. Um, actually, can you talk a little bit about cortisol and mm-hmm. how that affects the whole hormonal system in our body? So our cortisol being circadian, meaning it likes to go up in the morning, it's up and out with the light and it's down with the, uh, the darkness. So cortisol and melatonin are like the sun and moon. So cortisol is out in the day, melatonin's out in the night um, to help cortisol, of course, to give us energy, to help with blood sugar, to reduce inflammation, to support our immune system, all those things. Whereas melatonin is, um, melatonin from the pineal gland is to help us fall asleep um, and then, of course, is a great antioxidant. Now, the interesting thing is the production of cortisol, of course, comes um, at the regulation of our brain and our clock genes in our brain. So clock is in like the clock on your wall, which you know I know you talk about. So the clock gene is our master sort of timing regulator. And if our clock genes are off, 
so to speak, then that will affect all of the little clocks and all of our glands. So all of our other glands have clocks, little clocks as well, that they do their own thing, but they also answer up to the clock gene in our brain. So I have had a lot of women who have had crazy cycles and I will say, well, what are your sleep patterns like? What, what is your energy like in the day? Have you been crossing time zones? Do you work night shift? Like what, what are you doing to your circadian rhythm? Because that will downstream affect your ovarian rhythm. Um, and so even just that little bit where they're like, oh my gosh, you're right. I've been staying up really late or I have been maybe prior to the pandemic or even during that they're like, I've been traveling and, and crossing a lot of time zones. I didn't realize that by disrupting my rhythm, it's it can affect my production of estrogen or progesterone and you know ovulation and testosterone as well. So even our circadian rhythm has a big impact on how we make our uh, male and female hormones. Mm -hmm. Okay, question. Um, often like, I think this is super interesting, especially like this, um, like how, what, what kind of lifestyle habits really affect mm -hmm. on, on the production of hormones. And uh, often sleep, sleep is something that people sort of intuitively feel like, at, hey, um, I didn't sleep so well, so I feel like foggy and I feel brain, you know, mm -hmm brain freeze and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of daytime habits are there that can affect our hormonal cycles? Stress is a big one. <laughs> Stress is a big one, which is a huge daytime habit. Um, uh, lack of exercise, toxin exposure, um, meaning the everything from what's, what's on the foods we eat and the water that we drink to the skincare that we use to our how we wash our clothes to even just recently, I was um, talking with people about the scent in their house, you know, candles, decorative candles are a big thing for a lot of people. They come in very beautiful glass jars, but that fragrance, that synthetic fragrance um, being a, what's called a phthalate is actually an endocrine disruptor. And so um, even the personal hygiene products that we use as women, I have had a lot of uh, people over the years tell me they've switched to 100% organic cotton tampons or pads, what have you, or they've switched to a menstrual cup and they're like, oh my gosh, my cramps got so much better. My periods got so much better. I didn't realize that that, that simple step could maybe eliminate. In some cases it was hundred percent. In some cases it was 50%, but still that these, these little um, daytime changes that we do uh, can make a huge impact on the way that we make hormones. Um, but I'll go back to stress. And when I say stress, I mean, all sorts of stress. I mean, mental stress, emotional stress, physical stress, internal stress. So infection, inflammation, um, if you're fighting something or trying to kill something um, that the, the, the foods you're eating, you know, are inflammatory to you. If you know, you shouldn't be eating ice cream. Ice cream is a big trigger for your intestinal inflammation. It gives you gas. It gives you bloating. It gives you diarrhea or heartburn, but yet you keep eating it because you love ice cream. Like every single time you have it, you're just giving yourself little fires, so to speak, inflammation, which has a cascading effect through the whole body. It can affect things like your hormone production, your progesterone, your estrogen, your testosterone. You and we don't get taught that in school. We get taught, you know, like what happens in the GI tracts or happens in the stomach stays there. But you and I know that that absolutely can affect everything in the whole body. And then we hear it all the time, our clients and our patients and the people in our, in our comment section who will say, oh my gosh, I finally gave up ice cream and all like all of this, uh, my inflammatory acne went away and my hair loss stopped, or I don't feel so puffy and bloated. I didn't realize it was a systemic. I, I just thought, oh, I have ice cream and get diarrhea, no big deal. And so these little daytime decisions, as we, as you say, absolutely have effects on the, all the hormone system. Even the hormones we don't even talk about insulin, thyroid, <laughs> all of them. Yeah, actually, insulin would be interesting, especially in terms of I feel different type of, of diets and in terms of fasting. Like mm -hmm. there is a lot of benefits of fasting, intermittent fasting, for example, for, for the brain, for the energy, for inflammation, for everything. However, can it also be harming for let's say cortisol or mm -hmm be cause too much cortisol or yeah 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 maybe you can talk a little bit about your views yeah 
Yeah, I've actually um, interviewed um, two of my fast favorite fasting experts, Dr. Mindy Pels and Cynthia Thurlow, and we've definitely talked about this because some people can handle intermittent fasting. Some people who've never done intermittent fasting, but they're like, all right, I'm going to start. They read a book, they read a blog, they you know listen to you, and they're like, all right, I'm going to jump in and do 16 hours of fasting and see how I feel. And maybe they feel amazing right out the gate. And then other people same thing. They're like, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to jump in and they get to 12 hours. You know, they just 7 a.m. to or 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And they're like, I'm starving. I'm hungry. (laughs) I hate this. I'm like, okay, all right. We did it. Your body is not ready, especially if your cortisol is kind of a mess. Your stress is a mess. Your sleep is a mess. And if you're really used to eating all through the day, you know, if you're a snacker, a nosher, you know, you're like, I just, I'm a picker. I eat the rest of my kids' food. I have a sip here. I have a sip there. There's always something sitting on my desk. Um, when I pass the kitchen, I always, you know, grab a little something. So you're constantly feeding your body, but really making your intestine, your stomach and your intestines work. We need to work slowly for you. In that case, if you feel negatively, when you start intermittent fasting of, tightening that up or cleaning that up, jumping into 16 hours, isn't going to work for you. So sometimes, and I, and I've talked with uh, Dr. Mindy and Cynthia about this. Sometimes when you get a person's history, if somebody's listening to this going, Oh my gosh, that's me. I'm a stressed out mess. I don't sleep. And I eat all day. Jumping into 16 hours is probably not going to benefit you. Um, but you can definitely ease into it. You can definitely realize, gosh, you know what? I'm eating all day long. I literally eat from 7. AM to 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. when I go to bed and, you know, watch TV with popcorn on the couch, you can start to give yourself more breaks, stop snacking so much, be mindful of what you're putting in your mouth, focusing on your sleep. Like you can start to ease into it. And so I, I do think, um, as much as I love fasting, I intermittent fast a, a, a lot of the time. I'm, I sort of sync it with my menstrual cycle, but I do think it, in some people who just jump in and aren't ready they hate it because it does a little more, maybe a little, not harm, but maybe harm, a little more harm than good. And they're hungry. They're tired. You know, they're moody. They're hormonal. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's me. Like uh, when I started fasting, I, I felt like 16 hours was so long of a time. Mm. And I felt like, am I really not going to eat anything like seriously? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I was stressed over it. So I had to do it like little by little. And now I can't fast for longer periods of time. Although I've noticed it's not necessarily the best for me and my, my hormones yeah. and my stress levels and cycles. I, I kind of think the 16 is the maximum tops, maybe even less is, is better. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I do think that there needs to be also some psychological um, adjustment period or for some people that's necessary. Um, yeah. Right. And I, people will ask me when, when I say that I intermittent fast, they're like, well, what do you do if you wake up hungry? I said, I eat. I just, we, but it's taken me, you know, it, I years to figure this out. I didn't learn this in the first week. You know, I definitely experimented with it. I gave myself a lot of grace. Um, I also have a history of an eating disorder. I was anorexic when I was younger. So I'm very, my, and I've worked through that. And I'm very mindful of people who have history of disordered eating or currently, you know, have some sort of uh, disordered eating. And so to be mind, yeah, I don't want to, I don't, I would, I would hate for fasting to ruin somebody's relationship with food, but I also, If somebody has no relationship with food, if they just eat all the time, very mindlessly, sometimes we have found intermittent fasting can help them develop a better relationship with food of being mindful of what they put in their body and when they put something in their mouth and how many times they're reaching for snacks. Um, It can bring them to the present, but I do, um, you have to, when you're just starting out, I think in intermittent fasting, like you, you have to you know, be aware of some of these things or maybe work with somebody who has experience with intermittent fasting and fasting and can help coach you through it. Um, it's as much as I would, I know, I know the fasting experts are like, it works for every, you know, it works for a lot of people. And I've taken thousands of people through it. I'm like, that's wonderful and fantastic as you coach them. But for somebody's just reading this off the internet, um, they do need to be mindful that it, it, it could be a multi-step process and that's okay. 
Yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear about the history of eating disorders. These things are not necessarily uh, definitely easy things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm happy to hear and that you've overcome it. And yeah. now you even coach people with like how to eat correctly. And actually, that was an excellent mention that I haven't heard so often is that you can take an intermediate fasting coach. Mm -hmm. And that makes the process easy. Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually even seen, uh, I think my mom used this kind of app that tracks yes. how much she yes. did every day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, that made, yeah. That made it easier for her. And also yeah. better able I think that's a great idea for somebody who's starting out, brand new to it, wanting just to try it. Absolutely. Either a coach or a group or an app, somebody just to hold you accountable or to give you ideas of what to do or sort of walk you through the process when you're just starting. I, I love that idea. I would like to know how hormones affect brain processes. Like many people nowadays, they, at least I get many questions on brain fog, mm -hmm. on how to improve energy, focus, mood. Mm -hmm. Do hormones, I'm sure hormones have, have a <laughs> lot of role in these ones, um, how and why? Yeah, they have a lot of impact on the brain. I'll give you a couple examples, which I think will be really relatable, especially for women um, and their mood. So let's stick with estrogen and progesterone and just to keep it easy. So in our brain, we have um, estrogen receptors all over, all over. So one key area is that to make the enzyme that converts our 5-H or converts our um uh, tryptophan into 5-HTP requires estrogen. We need estradiol to bind to the, its receptor, turn the, turn the lock, and then you make, help make this enzyme. And now you can make 5-HTP. Now, when you make 5-HTP, then it goes on to make serotonin. And then two more steps, it goes on to make melatonin. So for women who have low levels of estrogen, Maybe they're headed into menopause. Maybe they have um, what's called amenorrhea. They haven't had a cycle. They have really long cycles. They're low estrogen. They maybe feel like they're more prone to depression in these, in these times because they don't have the ability to make 5-HTP like they would have if they'd had an abundance of estrogen to bind to the estrogen receptor. So they will say, gosh, I feel low. I feel down. I feel kind of, you know, kind of depressed. It may be not be full of foot blown depression. It might just feel like, well, I felt like I was in a good mood. And now I'm just feeling really, as I move into menopause, I'm feeling more depressed. I'm feeling more low. I'm not, I'm not really feeling, um, like, like this is really helpful. So estrogen can play a big role in the way that we make serotonin and subsequently melatonin. Now the other hormone progesterone, do you just some two examples of multiple Progesterone, when it breaks down, it breaks down into something called aloe. We shorten it to aloe, not the plant, but it's called A-L-L-O, aloe pregnenolone. Aloe crosses up into our brain, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it binds to our GABA receptors, GABA being our big inhibitory receptors. It's calming, it's soothing, it's relaxing, it's anti-anxiety. So when we ovulate and we make a lot of progesterone, then we can cross up into the brain and get that calming, soothing, relaxing effect. But when we don't, when we don't ovulate or we don't make a lot of progesterone or we're perimenopausal and menopausal, and we don't have that progesterone, a common symptom is I feel anxious. My anxiety is up. I feel more nervous. I just feel, I don't feel as relaxed. My sleep isn't as good as it used to be because we're missing on the bonus progesterone effect on that GABA receptor. And well, sure we have GABA up in our brain. It's the bonus that we get extra progesterone so we can feel extra calm and relaxed. And so as women head into their cycle, as they get close to their period, estrogen and progesterone start to fall if they're not um, uh, pregnant and contribute to some of these uh, mood feelings, depressed or anxious, or they're, they're, you know, women will say, I can't sleep right before my period comes and this can contribute to it. And that's just two examples that has huge impact on a lot of us. Okay. What about men? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very similar. Yes. So men also have, no men do make estrogen, which is really surprising to some men. They think estrogen is just a female hormone, but it's not, they just make a whole lot less of it. 
but it's very similar. Testosterone has the bigger play in the brain for men, but estrogen and progesterone do as well. But testosterone, because they have so much of it, is um, uh, we have testosterone receptors in our brain and definitely can help a lot with that brain fog, that energy, that uh, motivation, that you know, discipline to a degree, um, sort of the dopamine, dopaminergic uh, systems, the reward system, testosterone can really play there. And we know that as men have lower testosterone, even in, in, and especially as they get, if they develop higher estrogen, um, big symptoms they complain of are depression, lack of motivation, maybe weepiness, more anxiety, low mood, you know, fatigue, brain fog. And so we will hear this from men as well um, as, as we hear it from women. Unfortunately though, it's not talked about as men in much, as much. Um, and I want men to recognize that when they're feeling this way, that it, it is hormones play a big role in it and it's correctable in a sense. So just like women, but honestly, we've just been conditioned or brought up to know that hormones are affecting our mood and, you know, to talk to your doctor, talk to your OBGYN, talk to somebody about it. Um, men are not conditioned to do that, but their hormones absolutely can contribute. So if you're listening and you're feeling depressed or motivated or weepy or anxious, definitely have your hormones checked because it can, they can play a role. I love that idea. And I love that tip because I feel many times when we, when we feel that we are depressed, we are suffering from lack of focus or concentration. The first thing that comes to our minds, because probably because internet gives the first results is yeah. like, take a supplement, yeah. a coffee or mm -hmm. go out for a walk. But if you have a hormonal imbalance, walking 20 minutes in the nature is probably not going to help you that much. Mm -hmm. and, um, what are then some ways to measure these hormones? Where, where can people do that? And when should they maybe get tested? So I'll start with men because it's a little bit easier and a little more straightforward. Most men get a blood test. So most men will have their blood drawn. First thing in the morning, they will get what's called a total testosterone. They will get a free testosterone, free testosterone, free means free and available, uh, combine to receptors and activate them, do the things. They will often, hopefully, cross your fingers, your, your practitioner will also order estrogen on you as a man, if that's important to check. They will also order what's called a sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG. SHBG acts like a bus or an Uber or a taxi, and it picks up testosterone and drives it around your bloodstream. But we want to know what your SHBG levels are because, you know, like once you're in the Uber, you can't do anything. You, you're not free and active to bind. So we want to know how many, how many Ubers you've got in your body so we can compare it to how much testosterone you have. So, um, and then DHEA or DHEAS. So men generally get a blood job, but of course there are other options out there. There's saliva testing that look at the exact same hormones. Plus you can also do cortisol throughout the day in saliva. And there's urine testing, um, which is exactly what you think it is. You would just pee on a strip uh, a couple times throughout the day also gives you very similar hormones, gives you your cortisol throughout the day. Um, and also uh, the bonus of urine is that it gives you what's called a metabolite. So you get your hormones and then you get, where are they going? So when you break down testosterone, when you break down estrogen, it helps give you some more insight as to the direction it's headed. Now for females, oh, and with men, we, de we tend to do it, we do it in the morning because if we're going for testosterone, we want to catch you at your highest, what, what, where do you, um, when you make the most testosterone. So make sure you're going early in the morning. Don't do it at lunch on your break. Don't do it at two o'clock in the afternoon. When you've got your appointment, go in the morning. Females are different. So females can do all the same testing. They can do blood testing, saliva testing, urine testing, um, to get, uh, their hormones or combination of hormones and cortisol or hormones, cortisol, and metabolites, but we are tested very specifically. So we want to test roughly five to seven days after we ovulate. So for a lot of us, that's about day 21 or 19, 20 or 21 of our cycle. So if the first day you bleed, like you actually bleed and have to do something about it, that's day one. And then you would just count forward and nine, day 19, 20 or 21 is when you um, get your, do your hormones. The reason we're very specific in the time of our cycle is because that's when our progesterone, hopefully, should be out at its peak 
Plus we can catch estrogen there. Uh, estrogen gets its second peak there. Um, and then your other hormones, testosterone, DHEAS, cortisol, et cetera, et cetera. So for, we're a little more controlled for females. Now, if you have a long cycle, let's say you're like, Ooh, but I'm like a 35 day person. Then you would just collect later. You would, instead of day 19, 20, 21, maybe you're going to collect, you know, 25, 26, 27. And if you're listening and you're like, Ooh, but I'm a short cycle. I, I only bleed. I bleed every 21 days. Then you would just collect sooner. You would don't wait till day 19. Cause you're going to get your period on day 21. You would collect a lot sooner. And if you know, if you ovulate, if you feel it, if you're, if you're tracking, if you get the, uh, that the pre-ovulatory, the mucus, the fertile mucus, um, then ideally, like I said, it's five to seven days after you ovulate, which for a lot of us, as I said, roughly 19, 20, 21. So it's re we can really kind of hone in more, um, on females because we do have that cycle. Now, if you're menopausal, if you're listening to this going, girl, I haven't had a period in years, then you can collect anytime. Just like men, you can collect anytime, um, because you don't follow a, your hormones, your estrogen, progesterone don't follow a cycle anymore. So let's talk about thyroid next yes so what role does thyroid and the thyroid hormones play in our energy levels mood focus and the health in general yes um i just yes i'll <laughs> i'll look at the above thyroid plays a major role in fact thyroid even plays a big role in our menstrual cycle and our in the male's production of testosterone I've had many a patient over the years who had irregular cycles, didn't ovulate, were struggling with fertility, heavy periods, come to find out they had hypothyroidism, they had low thyroid, or I would have men that would have all sorts of issues with their testosterone and their doctor was like, oh, let's put you on testosterone injections. Come to find out they had low thyroid also, hypothyroidism, whether it was Hashimoto's or not. Um, and I think that's a really important connection to make, to always be sure to check thyroid because it does have such a big impact on every area of our body. What would be some of the sort of symptoms to, or feelings or sensations to monitor in your body to, to like, uh, know if you have maybe a hormonal imbalance? Sure. So a hormone imbalance in general, um, we start to think about things like, and they're kind of broad symptoms, but things like fatigue or let's say around the menstrual cycle. So fatigue, um, you feel like you have your PMS is your, you feel like your PMS is, um, you know, really bad, so to speak. It's, it's getting in the way of your life, your cramps, you have heavy periods, or maybe your periods are irregular, um, acne, hair loss, um, weight gain, skin changes, sleep changes, changes to your nails. Um, all of these can actually be linked back into a degree to have it, your hormones having an influence on them. Struggling with fertility, um, unable to get pregnant, unable to maintain a pregnancy, hormones can play a big role in this. So it's, there's a, like, if you look up, if you just search online, you know, symptoms of hormone imbalance, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of things <laughs> because the hormones just play such a role in so much of our body. Now, having said that is, are the hormones ultimately the, the, the root cause, the main problem. So if somebody says, um, I have really heavy periods. And I was told it's because my progesterone is low. Do we blame progesterone? We don't, we have to backtrack more and figure out why is your progesterone low? Is your progesterone low because you're, why aren't you ovulating? So you're not ovulating because something's wrong with your brain. Have you had any kind of, you know, head trauma? Is it from stress? Is it from infection? Um, do you have mitochondrial issues because our steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, first are produced in our mitochondria. Like what is going on that is making us not make progesterone in the first place. And it's the same with men and their testosterone. If somebody's like, Oh, you have low testosterone, but let's say he's 25 or 32. Do we automatically put them on testosterone? Is testosterone the problem? Testosterone is the problem with their symptoms, but it's, we've got to figure out why do they have low testosterone and back up from there. So hormonal symptoms are broad, 
there are a lot of them, but we still have to do more digging and figure out why are the hormones a mess in the first place? Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things that I hear a lot is I can't sleep or I wake up in the middle of the night and can't fall back to sleep. Mm -hmm. Can this be hormonal? Yes. Cortisol, thyroid, progesterone, glucose, and insulin. Yes. They can definitely play a role. Um, melatonin and our ability to fall asleep or ability to stay asleep. Mm. Yeah. And we may notice different parts of our cycle are different. So you may sleep like a wonderful, you know, sleeping baby. And all of a sudden, two days before your period starts, you have complete insomnia while your hormones shifted, you know, your hormone shifted a lot. And so that can be, that can really affect it. Or maybe, you know, you slept great your whole life. And then as you head into perimenopause, you're 45 all of a sudden you're like, what the heck? I slept great my entire life. And now I find I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep. Hormones are playing a role here. They're not the only thing, but they're playing a big role. They're shifting, they're changing. So yes, um, hormones do affect our sleep. Mm. What is, what is your view on using melatonin as a supplement? Because that's a hormone <laughs> It is like mixed, um, opinions or, or, or knowledge, or like, I don't know, is it a good thing to supplement hormones in the first place? So melatonin is a really great example. So melatonin, the body physiologically makes a very little bit of a melatonin. So all the supplements are one milligram, three milligrams, five milligrams. And it turns out the body only makes about 0.3 milligrams, 0.5 milligrams. Like we make very little melatonin, um, compared to what's out there on the market. So I'm not opposed to melatonin, uh, use for the short term. I think melatonin is a great antioxidant. So if you're sick, um, or if you're trying to fight something off, if you're a shift worker and you're trying to shift back your sleep schedule, um, melatonin can be helpful to try to help reset you. If you've traveled and you're flying across time zones, I use a little, I use point five milligrams, I think 0.3 milligrams of melatonin. Um, when I am in a different time zone to help me, uh, reset faster back to where I am. So when you, when you switch time zones, obviously you're, you physically are in the new time zone, but your, your clock gene, your thinks you're back in your old time zone. And so it takes time to catch up through the use of light and dark exposure. And then we can use the cheater method of helping using a little bit of melatonin to help Now, some people also are genetically can't make melatonin that well. I have had patients do their, their genetic tests and it it takes two steps to get from serotonin to melatonin. And one or both of those enzymes had a variant. And so they just weren't going to produce a lot of melatonin compared to maybe you or me. And when they realized their entire life, since they were a baby, sleep has eluded them. Um, they are probably somebody who's a good candidate for using a little bit of melatonin every night. So I'm not opposed to melatonin, but I do, it is absolutely a hormone. And I do think people probably overdose because on on the market, you can buy really high levels. Um, If you're gonna use it for oncology, so for um, cancer purposes, I'm not an oncologist. So I always say, you know, if somebody says, oh, I have breast cancer, can I take 20 milligrams? I'm like, it's not my, I don't know. It's not my area. Definitely talk with your oncologist or your, your uh, practitioner who specializes in, you know, integrative oncology, it is absolutely used a lot. It's just not something I know much about. Um, so there's a lot of applications and uses for melatonin, but it is not like vitamin C, you know, it's not like, you know, you can just take it and, and be pretty secure that it's nothing too negative is going to happen. Yeah. Well, I can like to this, I have a an experience to contribute because I have had a migraine. I have had quite a lot of migraines when I was younger and I was also prescribed melatonin for that. So mm. I try this, especially for cluster headaches. And I did eat quite high doses of melatonin for, for a period of time. And I noticed that I got a little bit depressed next day. Oh. I, I was able to even I I stopped the melatonin my mood got better and then Mm -hmm. I did this like a single night test and I could make almost a clear correlation between high dose of melatonin and next day mild depression well I wouldn't call it a depression actually a clinical depression but low mood yeah Uh, so so I do think that yeah like being very observative of 
how it actually affects other things in your body like I was able to sleep very great I, I saw crazy dreams though but like <laughs> yeah. I like I slept well mm -hmm. but I didn't have in the first place I didn't have much problems with my sleep so I guess that's why it was maybe too high dose or something I don't know yeah and I I hear that from people I have people will say again they will take I think high, you know high doses of melatonin and they'll go I had crazy dreams or I woke up and I felt very groggy the next day. I actually had brain fog the next day. I'm like, I think you are, I think all that melatonin was too suppressive and it takes time to wear off. So you have to go through the wear off part in the morning. So you're tired, you're relying on caffeine when really maybe you didn't need the melatonin or you were on too much melatonin. Mm, that's interesting. So I would look a day of optimizing hormones what would a day look like <laughs> yeah. if you think about it, we wake up in the morning and we're just mm -hmm. like today i want to be good for my hormonal balance what, <laughs> what do i do important things yeah what do i do so i will say the easiest um cheapest method are to use first of all to use light and dark to your advantage so as I said earlier, that circadian rhythm, our clock genes, um, humans run, as you know, a little bit longer than 24 hours. So the clock on our wall, the clock on our computer runs on a 24 hour clock, but humans are a little bit longer. And in fact, I believe men are actually even a little in stereotypically run a little longer than, than women do uh, in our brain. So we have to set and reset our brain back to 24 hours every single day. So we use that to use the setting with using light. And so it's getting a lot of press on social media now. I'm so happy about this. When you get that full spectrum light exposure in the morning, and I don't mean when you grab your phone and, and pick it up and in, in bed, that doesn't count as full spectrum light, but actually opening your window or opening your door, going outside, you know, getting or getting a, a full spectrum light box and turning it on, which are not that expensive um, and getting that exposure for 10 or 15 minutes in the morning. And then at night you do the opposite. It's winding down, it's uh, dimmer lights or, or uh, redder lights um, or red light blocking glasses and then sleeping in complete darkness. So night lights, blinking lights, the fire, the, we have um, in our house, we have little, our fire alarms are all connected on the same system. And so they have little green lights to let us know the battery is working. And I'm always like, they look like, a, like an airport runway. You know, like I have little green lights in my house and and so in our bedroom you know we use a sleep mask or just tape over the little green light because you know the little lights that shine um being mindful of your phone your computer electronics bluetooth wi-fi that are in your room so these things make a big impact and it's getting a lot more research which i'm thrilled about and like i said it's getting a lot more um uh press on social media, because I think as humans, we've lost that we wake up in the morning, we're groggy. The first thing we do is we grab our phone, then we go and get caffeine to try to get us going. Um, and then we rely on caffeine, um, and you know, sugar, and we don't get a lot of movement through the day. And then at night we're up, we're on Netflix, we're watching our show. We've got all the lights on, we're snacking, um, we're eating, 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 eating until we go to bed or we're working because we're entrepreneurs or we're um, moms and dads. And so we put the kids to bed and then that's our quiet time. So we can now pay bills and get on the computer and be in our phone and watch TV. And, and it's, very, it's very up energy as opposed to down energy. And just those simple steps. And we for sure saw it through the pandemic. I had so many people who were suddenly work from home and they were like, this is great. All I do is stay up and watch Netflix. I watch all my shows. I'm like, well, how are you feeling? And they're like, terrible. <laughs> terrible. I've ruined my rhythm and my hormones are a mess and I'm stressed out and I'm not sleeping that great. And I'm like, we, you know, we did what we had to do to survive. But on the other hand, I'm like, all right, let's get back to, um, having a day that's good for our hormones. So just starting with light, proper light and proper dark, believe it or not, can make a big difference. And like I said, it doesn't have to be fancy or expensive. You can literally just open your window in the morning and stand there and just enjoy the light. It doesn't have to be full sun. It can just be, um, even here where I live, it's rains all the time. And even the like bright gray from the rain is still good enough. I feel so much better when I get 10 ish minutes or I turn on my full spectrum light box in the morning when it's still dark um, to help my brain. We're basically trying to tell your brain in the morning we get up, in the morning we get up, get your cortisol up, get the hormones started to be produced. And this, that alone, can be super helpful 
in your day? Just those two things. Well, well, that's uh, definitely a good advice. I also noticed when I started optimizing the home indoor lighting, first of all, but also just going out in the morning and getting or or like opening the window, literally opening the window so I can put my head outside <laughs> to get that real outdoor light. It makes a huge impact. Of course, I live in the north. So in the winter, we don't have sun in the morning. Then I use the seasonal affective disorder light or the light box, as you mentioned, to get that get that sunlight. So yeah, that's definitely good. And also one thing, like in the evening, I'm noticing that I don't necessarily need to shut down the computer, for example, to get sleepy, but I do need to filter the blue light out. And I do need uh, to put envir- or, or the environment dim. So it's mm-hmm. not enough that I wear my glasses, my blue light blocking glasses, but also the ceiling light needs to be super, super dim or not at all, or have, having some salt lamps or something like that to actually get sleepy. And that's also very important for melatonin production, yeah. the, the dimness and the darkness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely uh, light optimization. Yeah. People, people love this because like I said, you, a lot of times, and I understand, you know, people, my patients will say budget, I, I have to be mindful of my budget. Like I'm already paying for a visit and I'm paying for, to get lab work done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we add supplements, like what can, what are the, what can we do that can be free, cheap, or easy to help with my health, my hormones, my resilience, my mood, et cetera, and using light and dark. Um, I think is a great one. You do have to be disciplined about it. You can't just wake up tomorrow and open your window and, and think, well, that didn't work. You know, one time, like you have to be consistent. It is a rhythm. So you have to get into the rhythm of it. Um, and other things, you know, even like using co- hot and cold to your advantage, I'm I, cold showers, ending your shower in cold, cold plunges, cold baths. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, like I said, I don't have a, any kind of, I don't have a pl- where I live. I don't have a, like any kind of bath, like a pl- cold plunge bath I can get into, but I feel amazing when I end my shower in cold water, even just 30 seconds in the back of my neck, the back of my body or my whole body really can be invigorating and help with that. Just recharge that mental health, that mental clarity. And I have had a lot of people, a lot of feedback over the years from people who go, okay, I got brave enough. And I just did the ending in cold water and it was amazing. I actually felt better. I didn't feel like I needed caffeine as much and using that consistently, which doesn't cost a lot of money. You're already in the shower anyhow. So using some of these great uh, tips and tricks um, can be really nice on the budget, but really great benefits on your health. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one quick question about insulin. And if we think about the optimizing hormones day, Mm-hmm. What, what role does the insulin play and how can we like make sure that we are optimizing that as well? It plays a big role and I'll actually relate it to hormones. So for women who have PCOS or sometimes called PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. So you, um, when in our ovaries, when we, uh, we have an outer layer in our, well, let me, let me back up. So we have ovaries and then we, on our ovaries, we have follicles and the follicle is what holds the egg. So on the follicle, we have an outer layer, we have an inner layer, and then we have the egg. So the outer layer are what make our testosterone, our DHEA, our androsenodione. And it's stimulated by a brain hormone called LH. It's also stimulated by insulin. So if you are set up or prone to, um, or have PCOS, PCOS, and you have a lot of insulin, it's going to drive up your production of testosterone, DHEA, DHEAS. Is that a bad thing? Well, it often manifests as cystic acne on the jawline, female pattern hair loss, which of course we don't want. Um, It can affect our mood, anger, irritation, kind of that testosterone androgenic feel. And it will also affect our cycles because when we have all this extra androgens, it can downstream affect the way that we ovulate. It'll, It'll stop ovulation. So insulin does play a role right there in the ovaries. Now let's say you're like, well, I don't have PCOS but I do have acne and I do have hair loss. Can that play a role there? Absolutely. So when you have testosterone, testosterone, male or female gets converted into its 
uh, potent form called 5-alpha DHT. DHT stands for dihydrotestosterone, super strong testosterone, super, super strong testosterone. And insulin increases that production. It increases the enzyme that makes that. So you may not have PCOS, but that enzyme is getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed from having high levels of insulin. And now you're like, oh my gosh, I have acne on my chin, on my jaw, under my neck. I have all this hair growth on my chin and my neck. Um, I'm losing the hair on my head. What is going on? Insulin can actually push the production of that DHT hormone and give you those symptoms. So not only can it, obviously insulin plays a, um, too high of insulin can play a big role in our cardiology, cardiometabolic, liver health, things like that, um, but on hormones themselves. And oftentimes we go to the doctor, not knowing we have, you know, fatty liver. We don't know that we have high blood pressure. We don't know that we have um, inflamed, um, you know, vessels, but we do know that we're losing our hair. And we do know that we have acne in our chin and we have hair growth on our chin and we sure don't like it. And so sometimes these symptoms are what send us in to see our practitioner. And that's when we find out, oh my gosh, you have high insulin. It's also going to affect heart stuff, but it is also affecting, you know, hair, skin, ovaries, et cetera. So it's important to know your insulin. What'd you say? Uh, I'm probably mood as well. Yeah. Oh, and mood as well. Yes. And mood as well. Yeah. Okay. I have two, oops, almost dropped the mic. <laughs> <I have> two, <laughs> two more questions. Uh, first is, should we measure hormones regularly? Should we like, even if we feel like, well, I don't have any problems, should we still go and check? I'm a fan of baseline testing. Yes. Does it mean you have to get it done several times a year? No, but maybe yearly. I think it's a great idea for yearly. I have had a number of women, men too, who've said, I'm really glad I had a baseline because as I got older, I could watch my numbers change and I could intervene or interfere or talk to me before they fell off a cliff, before they became really symptomatic. Um, and so I do think that along with your yearly glucose and your yearly cholesterol and your yearly physical, you should probably have your yearly hormones tested at the right time, because now you have that data on yourself and I'm a fan of data. And if we can catch you before you fall off the cliff, then, um, meaning where you feel bad, you're, you feel hormonal. Like now you're at the doctor going, what's wrong with me. This isn't working. But if I knew what you were through the years, I could go, Oh, here's the point that I think you were starting to shift. And so we can do something about it. We can make little changes that, um, hopefully are quick and effective and, you know, low cost as opposed to later when it's been years and years and years, and now it's going to take a lot more effort and cost. Hmm. Very good advice. I I'm also a big fan of baseline testing. So, yeah. And that's probably something that we often don't even think that it's good to have the baseline. So thanks for that uh, reminder. Um, so one thing that I would like to know is that if you now could go back in time and give your younger self advice, maybe something hormone related or might be whatever health related, what would that be? So, um, let's see here. Let's say a, t a teenager self. Right. Well, I was, so for me personally, and this does kind of just apply to me personally, but I, I, I have um, the genetics for celiac disease. And I found that out. Oh my gosh, maybe 15, 12 or 15 years ago, but I had growing up, I'd had terrible allergies, terrible allergies. I had had terrible skin, um, and hormonal stuff. And it wasn't until I gave up dairy, which didn't really help. It wasn't until I realized that I had celiac that I, and gave up gluten, that it made a world of difference. And so one of the, just for me personally, I would have gone back and told my teenage self, I know it's going to suck and it's going to be really hard, <laughs> but keep testing. Like I kept, you know, my, I would go to the allergist, you know, I would go to the, you know, the, I'd go to my doctor, my, at the time, my, my pediatrician, when I was a kid trying to figure it out. And so I would go back and say, keep testing. And I bring this up 
because I, it applies to everyone who's listening and not the gluten part, but the, like, keep looking under stones. If you don't feel well, if you know something is off, if you know something is not normal, just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. Like keep looking for the practitioner who's going to help you keep researching, keep looking for, you know, maybe it's just the wrong test. Um, a lot of times when you go see your doctor, they do what's called a screening test. They do very basic lab work, which is great, but it's also exactly what that is. It's basic and screening. You may need to get more advanced. Like in my case, I needed to be tested for celiac so I could go off of gluten. Um, and so you know your body best. And if you feel like something is off, which is why I like baseline testing, because you'll know immediately like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Last year, this number looked a whole lot healthier. And this year, this number is not looking as healthy and I'm not actually feeling that good. So let's do something about it. So listen to yourself and empower yourself um, to, to get a second opinion or third opinion or fourth opinion. So that's what I would tell my younger self is like, trust yourself. It's your body. You know what's going on. <laughs> Seek the help you need. That's such a powerful message. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's, yeah. That's definitely something that we all should keep in mind that you know the best if you are feeling well. And if you are not, and somebody tells you, you are fine, like trust yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like don't trust the, the person who is not inside your body and mm -hmm. um, if, if their opinion differs. So yeah, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, so this has been super interesting. I've learned a lot of new things about hormones and I just like hope that this inspired many people to think about hormones because sometimes, you know, we just forget that we have these yeah. messengers that are continuously affecting on basically every single function in our body and they are super important. Um, how can people find you and follow a little bit of what you do? I am on Instagram. I am at dr.carriejones. Uh, my website is drcarriejones.com. And then uh, don't make fun of me, but I'm starting to break into TikTok <laughs> doing at Dr. Carrie Jones on TikTok because um, one, I'm learning a lot of things on TikTok and two, but I'm seeing a lot of our colleagues and friends who are starting to do the short form video there. And it's fun and it's interesting. And I'm just all about helping people understand their body. Thank you for listening to the Mind and Psychology podcast today. I'd love to hear what really spoke to you in today's episode, so let me know in the YouTube comments in youtube.com slash at I am Ingaland. If you want to learn more about the topics of mind and psychology, subscribe to YouTube and Apple Podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes. Have a good day and see you next week at the same place.